Um, I want to first uh, really thank Car uh, Chairman Goodland, Chairman of the Agriculture Committee, who happens to also be the co-chair of the Congressional Chief Caucus for uh, allowing us to use terms today. It's very nice, and uh, thanks to Congressman Goodland and staff for this use of the We just got up by talking about the goal of today's, today's event. Uh, really, if nothing else, uh, we want to hand out some materials that will help you communicate with your constituents about a, a kind of a, an important issue that seems to be on the rise is proliferating. The Federal Trade Commission and others have dubbed it spyware or noiware. Um, you've probably heard these terms. It's really kind of a difficult thing to describe and define. Um, but with regard to the Federal Trade Commission, today we want to talk about the user power and aspect of this issue. Your, the Federal Trade Commission next week is going to have here is a work, it's called a workshop on spyware and adware and other software, annoying software. It's going to cause a lot of media attention. A lot of people are going to be focusing on this issue because there are consumer complaints, business complaints about this issue. So there's going to be a lot of media. You may get a lot of constituent complaints next week. Um, and we want to give you the tools and materials that you can respond to your constituents with some basic tips on how they can handle the situation. You also probably want to comment on whatever legislation or hearings or fact-finding issues you're engaged in on the issue as well. So um, with that said, I wanted to point out as you came in, you probably saw the FTC notice on the workshop that they're having. This is on uh, Monday and Monday, um, not Tuesday, but just Monday. Um, Derek Riddle from the Federal Trade Commission is, is back here. He'll be happy to answer any of your questions about the workshop. Um, and the agenda is here as well. It's, it's really a, a big fact-finding workshop trying to figure out what this issue is. It kind of defies definition, or at least has thus far. There are legislation that's been introduced in both the House and Senate. Uh, the House by Congresswoman Mary Dono, the Senate by Senator Burns, and who happens to be a co chair of the HNR Caucus as well, and, and Senator Wyden. Um, but today we're not really uh, going to talk about the legislation, uh, although there's legislation that's going on, as I mentioned. The Federal Trade Commission is looking at what type of enforcement and regulation uh, they can do. There's also a litigation aspect of this whole thing. Um, a lot of companies are being sued for putting spyware on people's computers. That's working its way through the court. It's going to take several months for that to happen. All these things will inform the discussion on what spyware is. At the moment, we really don't have a hard and fast definition of it. And people, for our purposes today, we're defining it as that which uh, those computer software programs that are embedded onto people's computers without their meaningful consent and that are difficult to uninstall, if they annoy you, then they're probably annoyware or spyware. And regardless of legal definition, you're going to need complaints. So, uh, first we wanted to talk um, about uh, how to define this. This is, um, this is actually the second uh, event in this constituent workshop series. I wanted to point your attention to the folder that you got. It includes a CD-ROM, which I actually have displayed on the screen here. Uh, if I scroll down, it includes um, a sample press release, sample website templates, actually the code you put some basic tips on this issue up on your constituent services page on your website, some constituent letters, um, if you get their responses to questions where you can send them out proactively, um, a short article on spyware prevention from, let's say, your member of Congress or a senator, um, which kind of talks about the importance of the issue and taking precautions, includes basic, simple steps that they can take, um, and then some town hall meeting materials. Inside the town hall meeting materials is, of course, our brochures and some of our tips, but also um, some Federal Trade Commission materials on um, risks associated with using peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software. Um, and that's included there with the book. Um, so, with that, let me just um, uh, quickly talk about spyware for just one quick second. Some of the comments submitted to the Federal Trade Commission this past month um, show that um, 75% of computer users are, were not aware that spyware was on their machines. Um, this is widely, uh, widely distributed across the internet. It is not isolated cases. It's not just, you know, that this has never happened to me. A, a great deal of uh, consumers and constituents have had this happen to them. So it's actually proliferated. 63% um, of users in another survey said that they did not consent um, to having this information. Um, so this computer software installed on their computer. Um, there's also a, a meaningful notice and consent process that's going on here too, which the Federal Trade Commission will look at. Um, as far as what spyware is, I think probably the best is to kind of uh, explain some symptoms. Um, one of the things first to note is sometimes you may not know you have spyware on your machine. 
sometimes it's, um, some programs are designed to mimic your normal um, processes, whether it's you know, pop-up band or pop-up ads um, in your web browser. Um, some of them kind of track your keywords, what, what websites you're going to, and then pop-up ads that um, are supposed to be relevant to that keyword search. Um, some of them can get a little more aggressive. They change your default home page or your web browser. Um, uh, they can change your search results and direct you to other places. Uh, some put up pop-up windows that just you cannot close. Another characteristic of Spot Spider is that very often they're very difficult to find um, and even more difficult to uninstall. Um, there are tools out there which we recommend in these materials. Um, there's several tools that we recommend on the website um, get that wise with for partnership today that provide a, a variety of tools that consumers can use to uninstall this stuff. But it really comes down to that you have to use in many cases a tool to find the link tips on how to avoid you know, spyware, you know, one of which is anytime you install anything for free um, or it looks a little strange, uh, make sure you look very closely at what installing. Uh, very often, as I mentioned, the Federal Commission has noticed that spyware um, gets embedded into the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing uh, the software for these services. Um, so be careful. If you have an user license agreement, you get the pop-up uh, I accept. You're going to have to start to, even if it's 20 pages, to look at the and that, that package. So, one piece of software, you may have five, six, seven other pieces of software embedded into that, that package. Uh, when you may only want to have one, one. So, um, we we'll advise people to look at the package. Um, there's a lot of other tips that are included in these materials. I just what we're trying to say to you today is please use them, um, whether it be a constituent in your next loop newsletter that goes out whether it's in constituent responses, maybe back to the district are getting questions about this. Um, so please use the materials. We're hopefully working with the Congressional Action Caucus. We can kind of serve as these legislation, litigation, uh, regulatory processes run their course, and we can at least give you know, your constituents some tips in the meantime uh, to deal with these, these issues. But um, I want to hand it over to Ari Schwartz with the Center for Democracy and Technology, and I'm with Frank Torres from Microsoft Corporation, and Becky Richards from Trustee, and David Sutton from the Courting Institute Association of America, and Gary <coughs> Layden from the Better Business Bureau online. So, Ari, um, I can ask Ari Schwartz to just make some comments and examples of uh, spyware that they've been looking at, that an industry working group, um, and as well as public interest groups working on looking at this issue. Um, they've also uh, bought a Computer that they've infected heavily with spyware, and uh, this is all sorts of crazy stuff. So let me just go back. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, that's true. We, we bought a uh, two hundred dollar computer from Walmart, and trying to basically we install, we try and uh, look up what, what consumers tell us happened to them, try and rework it, figure out what's going on, and then uh, reformat it, start again with something else, and try some different things, try and. Uh, recreate some of the things that you were saying are happening to them out there, and we have been able to recreate uh, a few different cases. Uh, one of the things that we did was we filed a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission against a company uh, called Spywiper, which is a company pretending to be an anti-spyware company that was actually, or, or their advertising agency company, uh, was placing uh, spyware on people's computers in order to uh, convince the user that they needed this anti-spyware program and it happened to a lot of people. In fact, our, uh, when uh, our president was testifying in the Senate on uh, in the spyware hearing, uh, he, he described the symptoms, and uh, Senator Allen actually said, yeah, "That's what's happening on our. That's what's been happening on our computer." So, I mean, this is really a broad uh, problem that's happened to a lot of people uh, to, to the point where uh, even the members are, are starting to uh, uh, get have their computers infected. In fact, I get calls all the time from reporters who got onto the story because their own computer was infected and they were trying to figure out how to get rid of uh, spyware on their own computer. Uh, and I think that, uh, as, as Kim says, some of the studies have shown that up to three quarters of people that have spyware on their computer don't realize that they have it. Uh, and when they find out, they feel, they feel as though they've, they've been invaded uh, and they're very upset about it. It's, uh, so a lot of times you'll hear the, the issue compared to spam, 
And in a lot of ways, it is similar to spam. The definition of what it is is very difficult. It's kind of a, you know, when you see it, um, definition that's, that's been put out, put out there by a lot of different definitions that have been put out there by different people, and people latch on to whatever, basically whatever they don't like that's out there, that's more spam. But what's different is spam is really in your face, but the spyware is, is, tends to be, for the most part, tends to be something where you can't really distinguish what is different um, uh, from, from the normal, in the normal usage. Uh, it's just something that over time you realize uh, is taking information from you, or uh, it's an ad to your computer. You seem to be getting more pop-up ads, uh, or it's something you can't install, kind of frustrating in that way. And so uh, consumers are gradually finding out more and more about it. We've heard from a lot of systems administrators at schools, at libraries, um, at, at business, and at businesses who say, you know, I've tried to remove this stuff. From our, I've been half my time trying to remove this stuff from our computers, and I know what I'm doing. I've had to reform my computers, and I know what I'm doing. I can only imagine what's happening to uh, the average consumer out there. And that's one, one of the reasons that this issue has uh, become heightened over time, even though uh, the, the, uh, you know, the outcry over it isn't, it's not as in your face as, as the spam issue is. Um, so uh, that, that's just a kind of a quick intro, but I, I also wanted to, do want to go into, as Tim said, uh, to give you some kind of, uh, of, of idea on some definitions. We, uh, we have been working with, uh, with industry uh, members and trade groups and uh, consumer groups to try and come up with uh, some kinds of definitions. And it's very, very difficult. It's more difficult than you would think. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that there's a lot of gray areas. Uh, what, what, what a lot of this, what a lot of the spyware companies have done really is really take advantage of uh, the way that software works out there and kind of uh, insert themselves into legitimate practices. So when you try and stop a company from doing something that's clearly fraud or clearly illegitimate through by talking about the technology itself, you actually end up perhaps in, 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 in some cases talking about hurting some of, some of the ways that uh, that legitimate companies do business today. Now, I'll give you one example of this. We, we've broken down, uh, instead of uh, trying to come up with definition of software, we'll, 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 uh, so spyware, what we did was um, try to come up with examples of uh, unfair, deceptive, and devious practices. Uh, things that are likely, uh, examples of things that, that are fraud today, that are illegal today, where the FTC, the Department of Justice in some cases, uh, the State Attorney General in some cases, could take action. Uh, and it really depends on the facts of the case. So uh, and those three areas are hijacking, uh, surreptitious, hijacking, we use that in a broad sense, I'll give some example of that later on. Surreptitious surveillance is the second, which is kind of the privacy concerns that, that have come up, and inhibiting termination, in other words, you can't end your relationship with this company or account and install the software in some way. And uh, that third one, the, 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 the inhibiting termination, uh, you know, we, one of the examples we have is a computer downloads uh, a program and wants to get rid of that program, um, and the program the, the person tries to remove that program. When we first wrote that, uh, we, we simply said, you know, the person was trying to remove the program, it doesn't all go away. The consumer wants it to all go away, it doesn't all go away, and therefore the consumer has been, uh, has been, uh, that fraud has been committed because they said that it would go away and it doesn't. Well, that, that's not always necessarily the case, as a lot of software companies pointed out. You know, there are programs that share pieces, and if you say, well, we're going to remove, it, we want to be uh, chosen to remove this one section, this one kind of software, uh, but if that one piece of that is being shared with another software, you don't want to break the three other applications that share that other piece of software. So we had to be very specific in our examples, but I think it kind of shows some of the tricky pieces here in coming up with a clear definition of what spyware is, because uh, clearly I mean, companies should be able to share components of software, uh, and consumers should be able to remove software and stop and end a relationship with a piece of software if they want to do that. The question is, well, how do you go about defining that? So we've come up with some examples of, of what we consider to be clear cases. In the hijacking area, we focused on um, cases where, uh, where consumers are our software is installed on consumer's computer and they don't want it to. Uh, so one, one example is a computer, a user sees an internet advertisement for a program, the user clicks on the ad, 
and she's sent to a page that immediately pops up a window asking if she wants to download that program. The user clicks no, and it happens repeatedly, where they keep getting this, this pop-up, uh, uh, you want to download this program, until they click yes. So they didn't really want the program, but the only way they could stop was to either reformat their, their uh, hard drive or to click yes. That is coercion. And, and, and I think that that's a good example of the kinds of things that we're seeing here. It, in, in a lot of cases, it's already something that's fraud, but a user might not think of it as fraud. They would think of it as fraud if someone, you walk into a store and they lock the door until you bought something, um, right, and, and didn't let you out. That would clearly be fraud. But on the, in the internet world, you know, keep giving you a prompt until you click yes doesn't seem like something that you would call the authorities about, um, even though it is clearly illegal today. Um, so that's an example of hijacking. But there are other examples of hijacking too, where um, a JavaScript will take over, will, will, uh, take over someone's homepage and continually rewrite the homepage and, uh, to, to a specific ad, to a specific or you know, the, 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 often, often times the porn, um, and the user tries to uh, change it back and won't let the user change it back, another example. Another the one example we have to see is already brought case is a dialogue program where uh, it will send out, uh, well, where a program will take over uh, a, a user's uh, modem and call out a 900 number and the user will be charged for uh, international, uh, international calls for 900 number, um, even though, because they'll shut off the sound and they'll dial out and uh, the user won't realize that that's happening. Um, in the surreptitious surveillance space, uh, the examples that we have are, uh, you know, I'll just read this one out. The program advertises itself as a search toolbar. The user downloads the program to gain search functionalities. The program installs the toolbar, but once it's installed, the, it also mines the user's registry and other programs for personally identifiable information about the user unrelated to the search functionality and without informing the user or obtaining consent. Uh, when, the user connect, when the user connects to the internet, the program sends back information to the company. So uh, the user thinks that they're getting a, a program for a specific purpose, and that, that instead it's used to collect information about them without their knowledge. Uh, this, that's something that we've seen in several real cases today. And then, as I said, uh, the, the ending uh, a relationship with a good company and the termination, uh, we've seen many cases there as well. Um, some of these come up because, uh, it, and it's hard to distinguish, some cases are simply that there's a conflict and the user can't uninstall the, the, the software. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about cases where companies are specifically trying to stop a consumer from being able to uninstall the program. So once it's on their computer, basically they have to remove it. Um, so that, those are basically the three areas. The broad areas, and I, I think you go to some of the anti spy websites, the list, you know, 50 or 60 areas, we try to compact it into three areas where things are already illegal, things can be done today. Uh, and again, this is a very formal, informal uh, event, so feel free to get up and get coffee, it's plenty of cookies, don't think you take this home. Uh, so, yeah, feel free to interrupt with questions, please. Um, I'm just going to get a list, but one thing I wanted to say um, before I get to your question is that uh, generally when something goes wrong with your computer, people people think it's first of all maybe the manufacturer of the computer, so they call them Dell and HP. What's wrong with my computer? So Dell and HP are probably going to call some of this. Uh, secondly, they probably call the, the uh, maker of the operating system that they're using, that tends to be Microsoft or, or Apple, or I don't know what you call it, or Linux, but, um, and, or the ISP. So a lot of ISPs are going to call some. Um, and then worse, the other thing, as I already said, is sometimes Linux the normal functions of your computer. So you'll be certain, you'll go to a certain website and get these pop-ups there. You think that the website itself is serving them up, and they're really coming from the software that's embedded into your computer. So uh, people in companies with strong brands who are very upset that um, they're getting some brand damage um, because of these programs. So I was going to go to Frank. Do you have a question about that? Yeah. Uh, recently, Google has announced that they're you know, advertising.
let me let me head up to Ari so we should have a policy post on it. And I'm not sure, can you just differentiate if there's if it's similar or different just by the way? Well, I think I mean, there's, there's uh, one distinction that I would make right up front, which is uh, sometimes people make a distinction between uh, spyware. Is it downloaded onto the computer or is it something that's more cool people you know, someone goes to? But that's not to say that there aren't privacy concerns. We wrote a policy post. We have spoken to Google about it. Um, you know, they, they made an announcement. They're talking about altering things uh, as we go along. So we're, uh, we, we're optimistic that they can address some of the privacy concerns before moving forward. Um, we wrote, wrote a policy post about it. I'll send you to our website, cpt.org. Um, and if you, if you follow the, yeah, we actually have a headline on, on, on the main page. So I would send you there for, we have a really detailed description of, the, of what we feel the privacy issues are. We do think that there are privacy issues with the way that it has been formulated today. I want to classify the spy right now. Okay. Um, Frank, first, Microsoft. Oh, is there another question? Uh, yeah. is the only state with a law. Uh, we don't think that it's a very good law. First of all, as I said, definitions are very difficult to do. Um, that definition in particular is extremely broad. Um, and uh, worse than that, though, uh, in terms of consumer protections for the privacy side of it, there are, there are pretty strong uh, redress me measures in the bill for for rights holders for in, in trade in terms of trademark, which is what the the advert company is bringing the complaint against, right? So they're battling out all these issues over the trigger. But in terms of the privacy side, there's really no protection for consumers. A regular consumer can't bring a, a lawsuit in that bill. And in fact, um, even the Attorney General of the State of Utah can't bring a complaint in that, in that bill, in, under that bill. It is not a consumer bill at all. It is a, it is a bill about, I mean, it's a law about, it's, it's actually supposed to go into effect uh, in, in the beginning of May. It's a law that, uh, that is about uh, companies and uh, battling with other companies and, and some of those issues. Um, the California and Iowa also have bills pending though uh, that are more consumer oriented. Uh, we haven't come out with, we haven't done an analysis of them yet, uh, but uh, I would say, you know, we're, we're, we just don't think that the Utah bill is a good an example of a place where consumers really can't take action today. Uh, and as I said, you know, a lot of this is already covered under existing Fraud law as well. So there's a, you know, and and one other piece of that mentioned that hasn't been said enough. I hope some people will talk about it later on. Is that um, the technologies that are out there today are going to improve over time as well. And um, you know, it's like spam, right? We're, we did need legislation for spam. We did need legislation for spam. We, we, we may need to revise that again as time goes along. We also need, but but really, where this protection are going to come in are technologies and in terms of self-regulation companies are doing something to uh, protect the consumers. And this is the same thing. If we don't have the technology to avoid to protect consumers, we, can, we already have all these fraud, law, fraud laws out there, and there really has not been that much action in this area. So um, there's only so much uh, that, that governments can do to protect consumers in this space, <coughs> although there may be room for, uh, for in certain areas uh, for movement in practices. Again, uh, there's things that consumers can do today Depending on the litigation, on legislation, that's uh, basic security hygiene. Um, be careful of what on software you install, um, and that's really what we're here to talk about today, right? So just said what I was going to say. Um, but, that, but to back up on the, on the Utah situation, um, just very briefly, and I think it really highlights the challenge um, both here in the Hill and the state legislatures to figure out if you're going to do legislation, what's the best way to craft it? And, uh, uh, the staff in both the House and the Senate are um, very good about listening and uh, hearing the, the concerns raised by industry. I think we're all concerned about doing something about the bad deceptive spyware. The, the, the challenge is how do you do that and not have a lot of unintended consequences. And I think the Utah situation is unique because it wasn't, uh, you know, normally the way that consumer protection laws work is, you know, you get a lot of consumer complaints, and consumer complaints on something very specific. And, and there's legislation about it in Utah. It was a, a company that was actually uh, being uh, affected by, um, they were calling spyware, they saw legislation that fixed it. And 
there's a, a group of companies um, and trade associations, and I see Steve from ACT in the back there, uh, who's very much uh, engaged in uh, trying to talk to the sponsor of the Utah Bill as well as the company that was involved in. Um, hopefully, I think as time progresses, we'll be able to work some fixes in the bill. So it's, um, you know, always that well, I think it's a, a really unique circumstance and uh, um, uh, it shows the challenges of uh, crafting something. Um, I like this slide because I like the, the graphic that somebody out in the headquarters and Randy came up with. Um, it kind of reminds me of, of you know, kind of the, the bad guys and the, and the good guys um, in terms of the, the people on the outside trying to crack into your system. Um, one of the problems that uh, we face at Microsoft with regards to spyware is a lot of consumers or customers uh, don't know what it is. They don't know how they got it, and they don't know how to get rid of it. Um, and so we're, we're working on all of those areas. I, I think the, the latest numbers I saw internally was, was around 60% of the calls that come into our complaint center can be attributed to spyware, but I, I, I don't think if you delve into those numbers, any consumer would actually say, oh, I've got spyware on my system. What happens is, as already pointed out, um, the time that they're getting hijacked, that, uh, you know, you've got, you know, I've got WashingtonPost.com on my homepage at home. I went to log on the other day and some site comes up that did not look like a WashingtonPost.com given all the pictures that were presented to me. Um, <laughs> so uh, that, that, that happens. And, and so they call up and complain to us. Or, um, or you get a lot of pop-up ads and you don't know how uh, you're getting those pop-up ads. Um, or you find your computer being sluggish, um, and that's when you call Kelly, you call us and say, you know, something's wrong with Windows, fix it. And what happens is uh, spyware isn't made to run efficiently, it's just made to get onto your system, m most likely in ways that, that you don't have notice, you don't know that it's there, and it eats up your computing power. So it's there kind of always on, running in the background, eating your cycle time, so you, your system becomes a little bit more um, buggy. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the signs of spyware, that consumers aren't kind of, would never call it this. Um, and so how, how do you get it? Uh, you get it through a, a bunch of different ways. It can be bundled into uh, different programs that, that you download. But if you don't read the EULA and you don't know that the, the end user license agreement for EULA also says that you know, something else might be downloaded onto your system that can bring you top of that. Um, there's drive-by downloads. Kind of the term of art that's emerged where you got to visit a site and you know you're kind of flipping through the pages on the site and something gets installed on your system without any notice you don't know about it or you could open up an email and attach it to an email that has an executable file and it's there. Um, you know, once spyware gets onto your system or other ways that it gets, you, you kind of get um, almost tricked into downloading it. Is there's a lot of social engineering that goes on and you got a lot of folks at Redmond um, who really kind of try to delve into uh, spyware and you know there are kind of all sorts of tricks out there where you get multiple windows that come up or you get pop unders or pop overs where you're not sure you know which windows is the real which window is the real window or there's some windows actually that you click onto it and you think you're clicking you know yes or no it's actually all yes and no matter where you click on the on the, on the page you know you're agreeing to download what's ever there. Um, and uh, there's some programs that, uh, some, some, uh, some parts of the operating system that we have now that would actually give you a warning, but what spyware does is it kind of hides the warning and so you download spyware without ever getting to, to see the warning that something may be coming out of your system. Um, uh, we do um, have two people who are, who are going to be panelists at the FTC workshop, so I have to be careful that I don't steal their thunder, but um, you know, stay tuned because uh, I think some of the things that they'll be talking about next week will go more towards kind of what the new technology looks like that we'll be using to help um, our customers, consumers, both in the corporate setting but also primarily in the consumer space, you know, recognize that spyware, that they may have spyware on their system, help prevent it from being downloaded in the first place and then be able to really uh, figure out how to un uninstall it once it's there. Um, before I get to
I just, you know, the, the effects, uh, effects of spyware are, it can, be, can be very damaging to consumers, um, both in terms of loss of privacy, but uh, potentially also in terms of loss of security. Uh, spyware is oftentimes difficult to remove, even if you see that there. Sometimes it can be really embedded into your system that even if you try to, you know, most people just say, oh, make it so that you can uninstall it. Sometimes there are unintended consequences when you do that. It could affect other parts operating system so our folks are trying to work on that if, if you can't completely get rid of it so that there's no trace of it is there a way to kind of disable it to make sure that it doesn't um, uh, pose any harm um, and overall what, it, the, one of the larger reasons why we're concerned about spy the uh, lack of confidence that it will fill in the same way that spam um, is keeping people from going online and, and using the web in a very robust way the people think every time they go out there they Um, th there are some tools that are available today, and these will become more robust. And like I said, stay tuned for Monday. Um, there's uh, free software out there. Your ISPs are concerned. Like Dell are concerned about this. You and Microsoft are concerned about this. Um, there's tools that you can download uh, just to skip through all this. Kind of adware, test control, spy lot. Those are the sites um, you can go and, and, and use them. And, uh, oftentimes, they're very good at um, examining. Uh, where there, there might be stuff on there that you don't know about, and then you're given the option of uh, down, uh, uh, getting rid of it, which is good. Um, as Tim and Argo said, there, you, you've got to be real careful these days when you do go in, online. There are ways to avoid it. infection. Um, because your computer kind of stay up to date. Uh, you just having a fire, firewall and some antivirus protection is a good first step. Um, diagnosing your computer means you know, maybe going to an adware um, and, and using the tools and then staying up to date both with uh, the, the security patches that uh, companies like Microsoft put out. Um, Semantics also engaged in that. But also with uh, the adware programs and the antivirus programs and making sure the firewalls there is, is all really important. Um, I direct all of you to the Microsoft uh, slash protect site that helps really walk consumers through the paces when it comes to security in, in ways that can also uh, help you prevent uh, spiders. So, kind of in a nutshell, that's you know, what we think uh, uh, we should know about you know, identifying spyware, uh, how it happens, and then uh, hopefully some, some useful tips for what consumers can do to get rid of it. But a lot of work to do in the industry as far as identifying best practices that <coughs> actors can use uh, increase consumer awareness and provide them with the tools and the tips they need and then the technological solutions uh, to address this issue. Thanks, Frank. Um, yeah. Frank noted the trust issue. There's um, these things are in the trust and the medium. Um, so very fortunate today to have this too. The, the main seals of approval for the internet when it comes to privacy. Trustee, Becky Richards, and Gary Layden from the uh, online. Uh, they have uh, online as well as a reliability seal. But um, can I just ask, Becky, can you talk from a, a, a trust uh, perspective of what the fee is doing? So, trust is, our, one of our main missions is to increase trust on the internet. And what we're seeing here is an evolution as more consumers are going to the end, we're seeing more people go to downloadable applications. Because it's sort of one of the, uh, we've been doing a lot of sort of research what is spyware, what is adware, sponsorware, everywhere. Um, but what is it? Is, what are the applications that are onto your computer and from what you The explanation that was given to me, which I thought was really useful, was having a downloadable application is sort of the equivalent of if you go to, your web, go to a website and check your email, it's a little bit clumsy to do it, you can get it from anywhere. But if you're in Outlook or if you're in Fedora, it's doing what you want to, it's quick, 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 it's responsive, it's it's that much easier. And that's the difference that we're seeing between using a website to content versus an application. So an example is something as a company like Weather, where it is pushing information to the computer all the time. What's the weather in your neighbor in your neighborhood? Information right there. That is much more effective than me going to the Washington Post site looking at it and saying, oh look, it's 55 degrees outside. I can sort of check it. And those are some of the differences I think as we see adoption of the broadband, we're going to see the adoption of more of these local applications. 
Well, that brings us to how do we know what's the spyware, what's not. And what Trustee is really looking to do in this area is try to elevate the good players. There are going to be sort of the scums down at the bottom of trying to do all these illegal things all the time. And I think, as both Ari and Frank have pointed out, many of these practices already are illegal. But what consumers need to know is when can they trust an application, when can they download it and feel like it is following best practices. So we at Trustee with folks at CBT and many of the other um, industry groups as well as consumer groups are working together. First we started by talking about media practices. We're really looking to what are the best practices, what are guidelines, and looking to see how we can really improve the notice. So a consumer actually knows when, for example, the company in Utah you actually don't, don't downloads the application to their really consented, and when they're tired of the application, they can easily uninstall it. Um, those, are, those work in some instances, in other instances, it depends upon the relationship with the consumer. But what's really important is that we need to be able to raise the level of who are the good place players so that people, consumers can download these and really get the effectiveness of the internet and really gain that, that trust. So that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to... Um, couple of months think about what are those guidelines and how do we get them into place and then be able to provide your constituents really good notice, really good consent so the consumers can say, oh, I see this seal of approval. I know that when I download this, it's not going to spy on me. It's actually going to tell me what it's doing and I'm going to want it. So that's what we're looking to do and I think that that's really the next step we have to go to. When you think about you know, some of the other aspects from a regulatory perspective, there are, you know, we need to get rid of some of the bottom, but I think as previously mentioned, it's difficult to come up with one of those. Um, thanks, Becky. Can you pass the microphone to David? David, um, we listed David on the program that you received, the right program as a niche um, <laughs> <laughs> My boss. He gets paid more money. but they're, you know, they're not located in Vanuatu. 
and so uh, which is where Kazan is located. And, and so I think in the, in the context of this debate, um, I think it's important for uh, you know staffers as they think about spyware to think about well you know why is it that millions and millions of people have chosen or been forced to download this spyware with file sharing applications and it's because these companies have no other legitimate way to make money because the way they make money is by selling advertising because they obviously are not paying anybody or making any money for uh, the people who create all of the stuff that's being shared applications and I think you know you could very easily envision a world in which it, it, it's 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 the other irony you know, just, just as you know, is that in some respects uh, I think or what you were saying about the definition of spyware is exactly the same with defining peer to peer. In other words, it, it's very difficult to define peer to peer in such a way that you you cordon off bad guys and don't get instant messaging and other things that have the functional capability of peer-to-peer -peer technology or in fact our peer-to-peer -peer technology just aren't publicly as accessible we have anything you want whenever you want it on the system and so I think getting to a point where you start to think about not functional technological definitions but about kind of best practices and what do good guys do and what do bad guys do you know good guys provide filters, good guys try and uh, make consumers aware about the risks that they take by either downloading the software or using an application. I think those are the kinds of things that if you spent more time thinking about those distinctions, I think it would become clearer and clearer who are the people that are committed to doing the right thing and trying to take advantage of maybe some of the positive benefits that come from spyware. I mean, spyware, just like peer-to-peer -peer technology, in and of itself, necessarily a bad thing if you've chosen as a consumer to give up some of your privacy because you want somebody to feed you ads that you like. I mean, that's your choice. The point I think that uh, needs to be kept in mind here is that that choice, choice is one that either A, most consumers are completely unaware that it's being made for them, and for those consumers who would like to choose to say no, they're often not allowed to do so, and I think a good example of that is um, with Gazelle, the most popular file sharing service. If you try and download it without agreeing to the EULA, which in essence means agreeing to all of the add-on stuff that comes with it, you can't download the actual application itself. So you really do not have the choice to get whatever, uh, in our view, we would say the, the illegal benefits of, of the software. But <coughs> even if you were using to share your term papers, you wouldn't be able to uh, get the benefits of that either. So I, I just hope that as this spyware spam debate goes on, that people will take a step back and say to themselves, how do we get here in the first place? And are we really talking about a kind of down, downstream problem that if we don't deal with the upstream issue is not going to go away? Because clearly the guys who are uh, running around trying to do everything they possibly can to not be accountable are not going to do anything and come sit around this table and try and come up with solutions that are going to protect consumers. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Gary is with the Council of Better Business Bureau's online program, Privacy and, and uh, the Reliability Program. I'm going to go to Gary real quickly and then field questions, and then we'll uh, then we'll take the brownies home with you and the food zone. That one's a really good one. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, you know, I'd like to bring this all back to uh, um, uh, business ethics, because a lot of what everybody said, I think, really talks about honesty and fair, de fair dealing in the marketplace. And as, as I'm sure you know, the Better Business Bureau system is, is first and foremost a business ethics organization, both our regular BBB and our online SEAL programs. And uh, consumer and business education is really at the heart of what we do in order to make the marketplace work honestly. Um, and with respect to Spire, I think it's particularly important to educate the marketplace because Consumers are not likely to understand the technological in injury that they are experiencing. Um, so, um, to show you that, that, that self-regulation is already on the case, amazingly enough, in year 2000, uh, we promulgated an on a code of online business practices. And I'm just going to read you one sentence from this code. It says that 
Online businesses should not deceptively interfere with a customer's browser, computer, or any appliance the customer uses to access the internet. Now for us, practically what that means is you can't be a member of the standing of the business bureau or hold one of our seals if you can't live up to that statement. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is, is that, I, that we need to teach consumers, we need and all the wonderful information Ari and Frank and, and Becky have, have provided. Um, it seems to me we need to continue this effort to make sure that consumers know if, in fact, there's something going on, that they, 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 they can recognize the symptoms that have been outlined. And we get, in the course of a year, um, BBB or BBB Online gets somewhere around 42 million consumers coming to it for either the uh, purpose of, of filing complaints or, or checking on a business to see if it's reliable. Um, and we're set up to capture complaints from consumers who may be injured. So I would, you know, in terms of your, your, your members' constituents, you know, please tell them to go to bbbonline.org or bbb.org and, and we, we, we're set up to capture consumers' complaints and concerns. We share, the, the, we share this data with law enforcement like the FTC, because we want to see results. Um, finally, I think I'll just kind of tie this all up with, with uh, the fact that just a couple weeks ago, I got a call from of, of, uh, an information technology department uh, for a large Midwestern university who had discovered that, that spyware had been installed on his computer without his knowledge. He was hopping mad. Um, and he wanted to complain, like many consumers, to the BBB. Uh, so, you know, bottom line, if it can happen to a knowledgeable academic like that, um, you can certainly appreciate the need to, uh, to educate the marketplace and the average consumer. Thanks, and, uh, I think we, uh, we'll just finish off with some questions. I mean, the, the, the way peer-to-peer -peer applications make money is they, you know, they they sell adware and spyware, which then, you know, they collect information and, and send you, uh, I do a lot of Kazaa demos, and I show people, you know, the copyright infringement stuff and, you know, pornography or whatever. You go on to Kazaa and you type in whatever you're searching for and suddenly you'll start getting, you know, pop-up ads that are related to, um, to whatever you're searching for. and they don't get any revenue by getting paid by copyright owners to sell their stuff. So they get all their money by um, advertising revenue. And the reason why they get advertising revenue is because they're driving eyeballs to their sites. And I presume, and this is just speculation at this point, that all of the ads and the pages and the other things that are on there, if you click on it, then they probably get a cut for it. Um, and uh, you know, I think some, some of the file sharing applications are probably worse than others. The other thing that I think demonstrates that that's how they were making their money is that if you look at uh, Kazan and some of the other services, they now offer paid versions of their application, a one-time fee of $29.95 to download Kazan. And oh, by the way, you don't get any um, uh, other software that comes with your computer. And of course, the trade-off is we need money because we're losing revenue if you don't get the free version. Let me just address the issue of ad supported software because uh, I think we don't have ad supported software better. As a matter of fact, I don't think anyone here oh, on the no. table disagrees with the idea that there are ways to do ad supported software that are uh, that can be beneficial to the company. The, the hard part with what a lot of the peer to peer companies have been doing is they've been touching a ton of programs on, and, and uh, I mean, some of them, like we tried on our coin and just brought it to a halt immediately. I mean, and, and there are other programs that, you know, I mean, it's not as though it's, it was like something that was too It wasn't the Twitter Maybe we have other things running on there, but other things you tried that were run just fine. Just one, you know, you, you pick the wrong peer-to-peer -peer program, and it just brings the thing to a halt. Um, so the, one, of the, one of the things is just the amount of, of stuff that they put on there. Um, and some of them know that, and they've actually told me that they're, they're cutting back a little bit because they know that. Uh, for what they, they realize what they're doing. But uh, some of it, the, the, the big problem is kind of the time gap. That a lot of the ad support, ad, adware programs have been focusing on 
sending ads out when people are on the web. But a lot of the programs that people are downloading don't run when someone's on the web. They're, they're standalone programs. So um, if, if the ad support is coming, a lot of times the consumer, what we found is, consumers will download the program, know that it's ad supported, start it up, and it will, it will run, it, you know, it will run fine, they'll think everything's great, and then they'll notice they're getting tons of pop-up ads when they go to the web. They don't connect, well, I downloaded this peer-to-peer -peer program, and now I'm getting tons of ads over here at some other point, maybe four or five days after they downloaded the program. They, 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 the connection, they also don't know that, that peer-to-peer -peer applications by default run in the background regardless of what you're doing. Well, that's they launch as soon as you turn on your computer, and they, so it's not just when you're up on Kazaa searching for music, they're sending you stuff. They, they, some of them are collecting various keystroke information as, as you're just doing whatever you are on your computer. Well, that, that's a good point. It's a good point. I'm talking about in terms of when they think that they're using the oh, program okay. and where they're getting, when, when they're getting the ads and, the, the, and, and kind of the misconnection there. So a lot of these companies uh, really have to do a better job of explaining to the consumers, um, you know, how, what they're getting into when they when they uh, sign up for the program, what it means to say okay. Uh, and a lot of times we'll hear, especially from parents, that kids clicked okay straight through, not realizing what the, what was what was sitting on the computer. Now, if, if, well, we give an example. We wrote a, a, a paper on the spyware issue, uh, you know, back in November. And we give the example of good, what we consider to be a good uh, ad-supported software program. Eudora, you know, which is a mail program, it runs ads in the bottom left-hand corner while you're using the mail program. Um, you know, as a consumer, it's very easy to relate to the fact that I'm running this program, it has an ad, it has ads while I'm running. It, you know you've chosen an ad support program and immediately it, it's, it's apparent, apparent to you. Uh, and they're not sending back information uh, about everything. Derek, and then Kristen, Derek, again, question, Derek, Will. This isn't so much a question as it is a pop-up advertisement. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let you know about some of the resources available at the FTC and my partners. This is the third time um, we partnered with the Net Caucus and uh, the group um, in Get Net Wise about um, helping us um, with common goals for consumer education. Um, so Um, <laughs> as you know, that brings a 
crowd. <laughs> so I just wanted to make myself available and let them know that I do meetings and I do victim assistance and it'd be a lot easier to do victim assistance if you could channel it to online or send out a newsletter so that people know where to complain, know where they are, consumer response centers so, are. So sorry for the pop up that I'm really stuck, but you said it better than I did. It's drill at pc.gov. Yes, and I have parts, so come see me. G-R-I-L-L at pc.gov.
technology has reached a point now where there are actually, I, I would argue, greater incentives in the law to do the work. So, I, in other words, um, in the context of the issues that we deal with, you are safer from a legal perspective if you create a piece of software for which you exercise no control over than you are if you create a piece of software that you control. And I think that that's a perverse incentive structure because what it does is it, it creates an environment in which people put stuff out to consumers and then can sit back and say, well, well, you know, I'm sorry if it has all of these negative consequences, but there's nothing that I can do about it. Therefore, uh, there's nothing that you can do to hold me accountable. And I think in, in a broader sense, obviously, the peer-to-peer -peer contact is one specific, con one specific focus. But I think in a broader sense, Congress is going to have to start to look at ways um, uh, to incentivize people to do the right thing. Because otherwise, I think uh, the problems that we're experiencing are, are only because law enforcement, the Justice Department, is is just not at a point where uh, keep up. Okay, uh, one question, then finish on the program. Um, I'm Suzanne Watt, from the Subcommittee on Technology and Information Policy. Uh, unlike her, I've actually read the new law. I've read it for Microsoft, and frankly, I don't see how they take any responsibility for their software either. But my question is about the what I see is, as the creep of spyware. When I read Google is offering Gmail, they actually want to scan both outgoing and ingoing messages to generate pop-ups of ads that are related. And what I'm worried about is, okay, the person who downloads Gmail or accepts or sets up a Gmail account is accepting that. But that means that everybody sending mail to those people is also accepting the fact that, perhaps to accept the fact that Google is going to search through their messages and, you know, to see what's in there. And what I'm worried about is that people have not is the eroding expectation of privacy where people are just like, yeah, sure, you know, search my email. What what possible harm can it do if everybody searches through pictures of my? I don't think they realize that there there could be problems with that. Well, I completely agree, and I think that's why I'm saying we need an overall privacy. That's one of the other reasons why we need an overall privacy uh, law. And generally, um, generally speaking, if I, I, I don't know if you were here earlier when we addressed, addressed the issue of Google Mail, but we've written some, uh, something on Google Mail. Um, I don't, I mean, it's going to be very hard for the spyware to recover the issues of Google, that, that, that people have with uh, Google Mail. There are other issues out there, I think, with Google uh, in terms of uh, things that Google Mail, in terms of how long we have to store it for. And, and, you know, I, think, I do think that the, there is a question of consent about uh, other people sending mail, et cetera. Um, and we address many of those in, in, our, in our policy post we wrote on so uh, urge people to read that. But, you know, again, the broader issue, you know, we're going to be going technology to technology here, um, and it will be an erosion, there is an erosion, it probably already has been an erosion of privacy, uh, the longer that we wait to, to pass, and not really discuss the main issue here, which is uh, a proper major, an overarching one. Well, uh, you know, we've, we've said that we need an online and offline one as well, but the, the main issues that keep coming up over and over again are online privacy issues. And the main reason for that is things like in the Google case, that you can do things online that you can't do offline. And, uh, and you can, the information gets tied together faster than you can do these correlations that you couldn't do before. So there is more concern online. We do think that there are concerns offline too, and if you don't address the offline concerns, eventually they're going to catch up. It's you know, it's, it's nice it's just. I think you, your point is, is very well taken, but I think you got to think about it from the perspective of, of the business side. Because, well, for example, in the music context, the music industry as a whole has come under an enormous amount of criticism by the fact for the fact that you know consumers like, well, I can't transfer something from one device to another device seamlessly, and if I have it, if I bought the CD, why should I be able to listen to it on my cell phone and on my PDA and on my laptop? Well, in order to be able to do that. At some point, somebody's going to have to have a little cloud in the sky that knows every single song that you've purchased so that you can get the convenience that you want in order to either transfer it freely amongst devices for yourself or with your family. And it's, it's this inherent tension between consumer demands for convenience and, and ability to kind of use their products and media the way they want, which invariably bump up against people's privacy interests for somebody 
not to know that this is the kind of music I like or other things, whether it's movies or books or you name it. So I think it's, it's an inherent tension between what consumers contend that they want in terms of convenience and, and the reality of, of the privacy issues that you can't avoid when you start to go down those roads. Okay, uh, one last question, but you know, uh, you can come up afterwards and ask the panelists. I'm just running out of tape in the camera, so that's why. <laughs> so one, one last question right here. Let's say you get your homepage hijacked or whatnot, and it's also something that you can't get back to the original setting. What do you do about it? It's not like something that you have 800 numbers saying, you know. So what we've actually suggested to some of the companies that want to go legit, they get an 800 number for that very reason. Um, you can't. Uh, there are, I mean, there are, com there are companies though that will, that Adaware, list, and Frank got up there, the, this website, the Vietnamese site, it lists a lot of uh, different technologies out there that will break the chain, that will uninstall, figure out this Java program. They know, they've done a lot of analysis to try to figure out what are the, these bad programs that are running and how to track them down, how to yank them out. Uh, in most cases, hopefully without destroying the, the operating system in the process, although that's not always the case. Um, but they, that's what they're trying to do, and they will stop it from happening and yank out the uh, the of code. So it's not like, um, so and Yes. Well, many cases. But if, again, I think what we've said on the website and on GetNetWise is that uh, when you use one of these tools, it's a little bit of um, it's an extreme annoyance, and it's going to require an extreme solution. Um, it's almost like you know, getting a getting a tick or something. You know, it's really difficult to pull these things out, and, and other things come with it. Um, it sometimes makes your, makes your computer a little unstable, um, and it can break things, um, but it's better than just not just suffering through it. So it's really kind of a, it's really great, but um, it really, it really acts like chemotherapy in a way. You kill a lot of big cells with that. So, with that, with that, please use the ID, um, sample, Federal Pay Commission website, the workshop is actually right down the street from New Jersey Avenue on Monday. Um, they, they workshops are fun, actually. Yeah, it's, uh, actually, I actually have a news article playing gives a background around that workshop. Okay, good. Um, in the past, they've had almost fist fights that I'm sure the commission swindle has broken up. It's really good. It's fun. Thank you, everybody. Two spammers.